this podcast and every other podcast that I make is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. They get episodes of this particular show early and ad free, as well as totally unedited cuts if we have edits and a bunch of other cool bonus content. So if you want to support this very independent show, make sure you check us out on Patreon. Hello everyone, I'm Alana. This is Neil. I almost did it the wrong way around. Welcome to Voice Acting 101. Oh, Video Game Acting 101 right. at this point. Um, Neil, I like to come in hot when I start this show. Who are you and why are you here? Yeah, why the fuck am I here? Can you use profanity? Well, who mission? gave you this link? <laughs> so uh, my name is Neil Newborn. I'm an actor, director, producer now, uh, mainly working in video games, but also film and television. I've been acting for about 28 years. I've been in games specifically for about 15 years, working extensively in motion capture, performance capture, voice over work as well. I also direct now. Uh, and have a production company called Performance Captured. And um, we are a production service company as well as producing um, performance work. And also we also do little mini two day workshops uh, to teach people the technicalities of motion capture to apply their craft to it, to try and get into the industry. I'm tired just listening to oh, all of those Specifically, things. sorry, I should should have added non-profit. It's a non-profit. Oh, workshop. that's amazing. So we, we're, yeah, we run it as the actual baseline cost of what it costs us to run wow. the company. and also what it costs to run the actual workshop and we don't make any profit of it that's incredible um but yeah when do you sleep don't know i also stream <laughs> uh as a gentleman armchair streamer i saw and that <laughs> I big signings and conventions as well so i'm not a lot right at the moment i'm not really sleeping very much, doesn't sound like fine. It. yeah well yeah, it's fine it's fine for now <laughs> i don't to catch up I, on you i have a lot of energy so i'm pretty bouncy great um, but even i get to no, so that's good. Yeah. Well, very, very impressive uh, resume that you have there. But nice. uh, I want to take it back to before you had a cool resume. Uh, how did you get okay. started? Uh, what what led you on the path to where you are today? Um, quite a few people actually really helped me um, get into acting. I think I discovered acting when I was eight. Um, watching Brian Blessed <laughs> on stage, uh, the original Cats, because I'm fucking old. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I thought it was such a mind blowing experience of this idea of this one because in the interval he used to sit in in the interval alone in this enormous makeup and costume, which was because he was the big sort of tufty vagabond cat. Uh, I can't remember the name of the cat, but uh, he was the old guy in it. And he used to meet all of the kids. All the kids would go up and see him. And I remember letting all the kids go in front of me because I wanted to be alone with him on the stage. It was a very strange, quite, it was like a mini epiphany, I guess. There was something about being alone on a stage, be able to captivate an audience mm. live and tell a story and have everybody's attention on the story that you're creating with other people that I just thought was the wildest thing I'd ever seen at my tender young age of eight years old. Uh, coupled with being a lifelong geek and role player um, and stories have been an interesting in, uh, integral part of my childhood adult life um, and, and I think spiritual makeup if you want to call it like that that to be honest with you I think I was always going to end up in some kind of storytelling capacity mm. because I just think it's a fascinating way of working out who we are seeing where our potential future and potential dangers of humanity can be I think it's a really beautiful way of, of exploring that with people it's very important and maybe yeah and maybe if, I mean you're a writer you know if, if you're lucky enough you get to maybe even change somebody's point of view maybe so it's very cool yeah or at least challenge people right I think that's like or at least challenge know, people yeah like yeah, at least at least, least make them think yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, there's other people, I'll carry on like saying how I got into professional work, but I think on this point, I think it's important to think we've somehow during the last 20, 30 years, or maybe 20 years, we've lost in, certainly in America and in, in the UK, maybe in some parts of Europe as well, we've lost this this ability to debate. We, we now sort of, it's very polarizing mm. at the moment. People are either... I mean, woke is a strange term in the first place, but like anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti, you know, prejudice, right? Or people that feel marginalized and then pushed to the right or maybe have the right wing views and actually believe in that stuff, which is crazy. But but they, they sort of get demonized now so severely that there is no middle ground, it's true. I feel, of easy conversation saying, listen, I, I respect you, don't agree with me. You have to respect that I don't, you don't agree with me either, vice versa. But let's talk it through and see if there is a way of compromise. Now, the idea of compromise itself is like a negative thing. But why you can't compromise it at all? I think that there's, there's no way through that both people can so find much way to through. unpack there. In that, like this could be a so whole separate podcast. But I very much feel mm. like, especially living in the US, Australians are very lazy, or at least they were when I was home. So this didn't happen quite as much. Yeah. Um, politics and sports <clears throat> teams here 
also sorry my webcam keeps sure. freezing um but it's more about my team winning than it is about uh voting on policies about, or having conversations winning. it's about winning yeah and it's it's, it's about rough winning. to watch it, which is really fucked up because humanity there's only one race on this planet i believe it's human there's ethnicities there's backgrounds there's nationalities there's cultural differences absolutely but we're all human. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of winning over other humans when you're talking about living and having a better way of living, yeah. uh, it's crazy. It's insane. So, yeah, I mean, I just feel that this, like many of us, you know, this world has become somehow more fractured. And I think a lot of that is because we demonize people for their views immediately. As opposed to going, well, I don't agree with that. And I think that's kind of fucked up, but I want Again, to talk to you about it. Again, we demonize them for sport. <laughs> it's it's rough. Yeah, like, you know, and, and I think a lot of it is you want to be righteous by telling them that they're wrong because it makes people feel better than you want to understand where they're coming from and have a conversation. Mm. And I think that you're absolutely right that art, performance, um, mm. because you can have a conversation without that immediate defensiveness or need to win can kind of cut through that in a way like nothing else can. Unfortunately. I think you really can. I think that's true. Yeah, I think you really can. And then that's the thing I think that art is the first thing to be destroyed by ultra right wing governments, fascism, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. because it does have a, a very deep impact on people I and mean, in a subtle way, sometimes not just an overt way. So I think it's like it's always the first thing. For instance, when Thatcher came in, when art, the Tories we have now, they're slashing the arts, they're destroying yeah. the arts. Even though it makes so much money for the UK and America, it's the first thing to be under attack because alongside education and health <laughs> which know, who needs them things. who needs any of these things no, you know what i mean my guns would you, why would you give people that are struggling <laughs> waste of time it's nonsense isn't it so yeah, i think it's, it's, a, it's a sadness really especially because people who claim to be capitalists are like well why don't you make a lot of people intelligent and a lot of people healthy and then maybe you'll actually get more money in the country it's, obviously you'll have less power by that it's uh, a very saying. again totally separate podcast but such a weird uh branch of capitalism that we're in right now that i'm actually very worried about is like Basically. because of ai we're kind of at the first stage of capitalism where we don't oh my god this webcam uh where we don't actually really need workers to be healthy you used to at oh, yeah. least need your workforce to be healthy, so you used to at least have to try to take care of them so that they would continue to work and at least continue to buy things. I'm really yeah. worried with the the road to AI and robotics that that is humans being healthy is no longer going to be a priority to capitalism, and I don't know what happens to mankind. It I think is, it's already the case. I mean, in America, not great. Is a good example. America is one of the highest hourly, you know, the monthly, weekly hours of people working, and yet compared to Britain or compared to Germany or compared to Japan even. And their wages are so much lower. It's kind of a bit mad, really, isn't totally. it? Totally. It's uh, like less than a price of a coffee cup in some states, which is just like yeah, yeah. very difficult to comprehend. I was making $16 an hour working at McDonald's in Australia as like a 16-year-old or whatever. Nuts. Yeah. Anyway, uh, acting. Anyway. <laughs> That's a thing you've done. <laughs> How did yes. that happen? Um, so, so I was very lucky. I had some really wicked uh, English teachers, very cool English teachers. Um, Same. That helped. Very formative. Me. Yeah, I actually lost one of them recently, a guy called Bob Mellowish. Bob um, and I became friends beyond school. We were That's friends, amazing. kind of became friends in school. I used to babysit his daughter. <laughs> and like, just, it was just, we just had a good friendship beyond just being a, a master and a student and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And he, he was very much into theatre. Very few kids were into it. I was one of the few people continually trying to get into the the, the plays that we put on. Uh, Mrs. Fair was another one as well. And and through those two, they sort of, and my mum as well, actually, um, the, the sort of love of theatre was there. I was going to say, somebody took you to Cats at eight. Yeah, man. And my mum used to take me to, I used to live near Stratford-upon-Avon. So we were very lucky that we used to go down occasionally to see a Shakespeare play. Um, I thought so I saw Simon Russell Beale when I was about twelve years old in Richard the Third, and it was mind blowing. Uh, you know, obviously standing up sometimes with the cheap seats or whatever, but I got to see it, which was really cool. My she used to drive me like forty five minutes um, from where I used to live to to there and back again just to see a play. It was really cool. So yeah. I was very lucky. I then got to Central Television Workshop under. Um, uh, it was really cool, actually, because it was the first time I was interacting with the idea of being professional. I managed to get a gig when I was about 15, 16. Wow. Um, my first ever TV job, which is called Criss Cross, which is this bizarre. Can you still find it? TV. I think it's possible. <laughs> well, I'm in it for like a, I'm in it for a hot second. Amazing. Um, and I had to wait the whole day for that one scene. I was just so fascinated with the set. It was amazing. I actually had a great time, even though I was only there for like one scene. Mm. 
to do an American accent, you know, it was, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was great. And it gave me a taste of like, this is what I want to do in my life. Yeah. Um, I was even very lucky to go to the National Youth Theatre under the now sadly late um, Ed Wilson, who was an incredible um, mentor, an incredible, really a, a shining light. Um, especially because National Youth Theatre is a wonderful, it's a charity. Um, and yeah, when you say place. lucky to do that, what do you mean? Like, is there an audition process for that? Like, I, I don't yeah, have almost process. no idea what that is. It's an audition process. It happens every year. They do professional plays, it's, even though they're teenagers and kids. The age limit used to be up to 21. It might have shifted now, but I'm pretty sure it's about like 15 or 14 to 21. Uh, people can go into the tech side as well, and they go into the actor side. Uh, so you can do pretty much everything you can do in theatre, but it's all run, obviously, mentored by adults, mentored by other working professionals that come in to help the seasons. But it's an amazing resource, and it started, a lot of people have been there, have gone through National Youth Theatre, and um, uh, it, it is a beautiful, beautiful in, institution that still exists. Mm -hmm. um, it is a charity. Um, I've just speak, spoken to them, actually. I'm going to try and help them out with some mocap stuff maybe in the future. I need to have that meeting with them. Um, and that's how I got started. I got spotted there as by an agent. Uh, I got picked up. I started working very quickly, which was great. And then I realized I needed to train. And then um, training happened. And after about four years of hardcore method, I started doing other things as well because that was brutal. What does that mean? What is a uh, hardcore method? Well, it was just... The hardcore method. Um, I had a teacher that was very, very talented, and I'm pretty sure was a bit sociopathic as well. <laughs> so, uh, Great combo. Was <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I'd, I'd been working for a few years, and I sort of plateaued in my ability because the industry kicked up, and it was very much like I didn't understand the industry very well, and I thought I had to be a certain way as an actor, and I, I really lost sight of why I was doing it in the first place. And then luckily enough, my my friend Giles Foreman, who's now also has been my mentor for about 16, 17 years now. Um, I met I then went from four years of hardcore method and wanting to like just not be an actor anymore to then talking to him and saying, well, why don't you come and do some training with me? Because he was my friend beforehand. Um, and I started training with him and realized you're the teacher that I need. Mm. Uh, and then I got to meet Roberta Wallach, Eli Wallach's daughter, who's an amazing teacher, is also one of my mentors. I work with people like Nivin, uh, Linda Nivquist who's an amazing Swedish movement uh, specialist, who's never been an actor, but specializes in movement and wow. they specialize in larvae work. I studied everything from Meisner, clown work, mask work, community de lato to, I mean, animal work, everything. Cool. And I still sort of study in my own time, really. I still try to seek out stuff. So it was a really incredible experience how to get how I got started um, and then inevitably dipped and then inevitably had to fight my way back and not be bitter and... Um, yeah eventually being so unbelievably broke for so long uh so many years being incredibly broke that i eventually uh, found games um uh, almost in an act of desperation of like wanting to work wanting to be a character actor and also not having any money <laughs> and uh, i was very lucky that i was a gamer anyway so i used to i found basically um uh audio motion um through an article in pc gamer and through Audio Motion, Brian Mitchell, Stacey Boisel, they, they hired me on to Ghost Recon Future Soldier to do mocap and stunts and combat. So I used to do a bit of army. I'm gun trained and I do a lot of stuff like that, as well as martial arts and a bit of tumbling and things like that. So I have a wide range of skills that were very applicable. Sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, I was very lucky. They took me under their wing and then they just started giving me all this work because at that point, nobody wanted to do it. This is back in 2009, 2010. And nobody wanted to do the work. They actually, I've had multiple people tell me it's going to ruin my career. I was like, well, my career catering isn't as important to me. <laughs> what is I there to ruin? <laughs> yeah. So I was very much like, no, this is pretty cool. Um, but because nobody really wanted to do it, there was only about a dozen of us doing it in the whole mm. of the UK. And, wow. and we had all these American projects coming in as well. It was just like, okay, well, we'll just play everything. So I got to take my face off, which allowed me finally to be a character actor, which I was always struggling with in TV and film. Um, That's interesting. And, uh, the idea that you, you know, weren't necessary you didn't necessarily look like yourself gave you a level of freedom yeah i mean theater i started hmm. in theater i should say after national youth theater so i went to bloomsbury edinburgh fringe festival did plays there and also play at the royal cork and other people with um amazing amazing play with christopher shin was the writer of that dominic cook was the director a phenomenal director so that was like my first taste of i can do this i'm a, i'm a legitimately yep. an actor this is not a mistake this is something i have to do 
Um, I did a lot of TV, a lot of bad TV, some good, a lot of films as well. So, you know, by the time I got to games, I had a lot of experience, but I was feeling very down and dejected. And really, I was very close to quitting um, acting, actually, probably literally the month I found the article. I think I was I was literally had to have a sit down with myself saying things are not good. I think mm. I'm not good. I'm not OK. Mm. And I may have to quit this dream. Um, and then I found mocap. Amazing. And it all changed. Um, yeah. I'm sure my mocap mark is. A, oh, I didn't even honest. notice. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah, it's so rad. Religious, it's not really religious. It's just motion capture markers. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure everybody wants me to ask you about Baldur's Gate three, but you touched on something. You know, I've been doing this show for a while, but <laughs> nobody has mentioned before, which is mentorship. Yep. Uh, you know, I've spoken to a bunch of actors, and I'm sure they have mentors, but you're the first person who's like, I feel like you've really highlighted it. And I know that there are a lot of people who listen to the show who are interested in getting into acting. Um, how do you yeah. approach finding a mentor? And after that, how do you approach figuring out if they're right for you? Like, what what is the compatibility test to make sure that you have a mentor who is actually going um, to help you? Well, you don't know until you try. So the first thing is trying to find a teacher in the first place. Um, being open to it, I think, is the other thing. And mm. also, you know, and knowing that it may not work out. I mean, first teacher I had taught me a lot, um, but he made me hate myself as an actor. Um, I don't think he's very responsible. And the whole thing was a bit of a cult, cult of personality, I found. Yeah. Um, and also he'd target people that he didn't like, which you can't do. You know, there's, he also used to be like... Uh, you know, if you have problems, go and see a therapist. It's like, well, you're causing me the problems. You have a duty of care. It's and I know very toxic. Mental... Yeah, super. <laughs> and I know now as a, as a mentor myself, you have a duty of care to the students, whether you like it or not. You yeah. cannot fuck people up like that. Yeah. You can challenge them with their work. You can definitely make sure they don't get away with shit with their craft. But you can't undermine them as people. You can't do that. Um, so that that was kind of was a heavy experience. Yeah. So that didn't work. I had to leave because it was just like you make me not want to be an actor. You make me doubt myself as an actor, which yeah. you shouldn't be doing as a mentor. My oh, my you, have, you have a whole died. audience of people to do that. You don't need to have yeah, a teacher man, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. You know, I don't need your teacher to do that. No. So I found and I found my friend um as a mentor, and he's the opposite. He makes me want to do think I can do even more than my ability may allow me to do. And he definitely helped me. Giles helped me cultivate the passion for the craft again. And um, for that, I'll be eternally grateful to him. Uh, Giles Foreman, Center of Acting in Soho. He also teaches in New York, LA, Sweden, Switzerland. He's all over the planet, all over the place like me. So he's an amazing human being. Um, so, you know, finding a mentor is tricky. I think the big thing is that sometimes you have to work out, am I having a problem with the mental? Am I having a problem with the craft? And that's an ego me thing. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, is it me? I, I think I know more than I do, or I should know more, or this is frustrating, or I don't want to do it because it's hard. Yeah. Or is it because this person is not a good mentor, healthy mentor, of which there are many out there that aren't great, I would say. I've yeah. met quite a few. Um, so when I met somebody like Giles, it was like, no, you make me want to do everything. You make me want to just fucking take a risk every time I get up there. And I suddenly saw a massive uptick in my craft work. Um, so having, and that was you know to do with the fact that I believed so it's it's hard you have to check your ego a lot and go actually i don't know shit yeah <laughs> well, i know a lot but there's still so much more i don't know and it's an the other thing as well is engaging with the idea that craft work is a lifelong experience you don't you don't even the ten thousand hours i mean i've done way over ten thousand hours in the volume i am considered to be a, a, a you know an expert or whatever in the in motion capture because I earned that, I earned that over 15 years. However, there is still stuff that I go, oh shit, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Or, okay, well, how do we do this? Or, oh, that didn't work, we should try something else. But what it does do give you is a confidence that you don't panic, you don't get into the whole idea of the imposter syndrome of, I'm bad, I'm not good, and I want people to think I'm good and all that kind of bullshit. Instead, you're just like, well, here's the problem, here's the challenge, how do I deal with that? How do I, how do I work that out? Such a real so, part of the human experience, right? Of like, I think that we all yeah, sort of go through this, any, I know everything, I'm incredible. Oh, I don't know shit. That sucks. And then, oh, I don't know What's shit. Right? And I'm that's okay. Right? I know. I'm incredible. <laughs> it What's happens. Right? But then you get to the bottom and you're like, I don't know very much. And that's awesome. And I have the opportunity to learn. And that's the coolest. Like one of my friends who's an actor yeah. has this experience uh, that I think about all the time where an actress who is very famous, who I won't name, um, super well known, yeah. came up to him after seeing him in a movie and said, with a notepad, um, and said, how did you do this? And he, compared to her, is not at all a name. And he was just like, she's so far along in her career and she was still very interested in how I delivered a particular thing and the thought that went into it. And it's like, that's yeah. 
that's the thing that not only keeps your spirit alive, but like I think stops <clears throat> you from feeling like a failure is just the eagerness to learn, right? Just like stay also, hungry. It, we do, we don't we don't learn a huge amount from success. Success reveals True. a lot about the person, but we don't as people learn a lot from success. We learn a lot from failure. Yeah, success and I, is comfortable. The, success well, success is just it just is. It's just like you succeeded. Great. Great. <laughs> Feel good. You know, and don't don't turn into an asshole. You know? yeah. uh, or if you are an asshole, then that's going to be revealed. And, you know, it's just one of those things. Whereas failure, especially if we have the humility to accept it, is a wonderful thing. I mean, at the first four years of method, I crashed and burned in every goddamn scene I put up there. I did learn a lot from that. Yeah. Um, and I, I still take risks with work, which is great. So I think you have to be uncomfortable a little bit or not know quite how this is going to work out for it to be the best take that you do, I guess, you know? So being comfortable is not a good thing for an artist in the work. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely an experience, but it's a craft, man. It takes a lifetime. And I certainly wouldn't call ever deem myself a master of acting. Absolutely not. Um, but I'm definitely a journeyman. I'm definitely, um, or journey person, I guess. I'm definitely somebody who is, is definitely understands a lot about it. Um, and is willing to continue to learn and willing to continue to evolve. And every job is new, you know. That's the great thing about being a performer is that every job is something different, which is cool. Sold. If I had a job to give you, you'd be hired. <laughs> but I don't, so. <laughs> it's not my field, unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I do, before you have to go, have to ask, obviously, about yeah. Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, how did yeah. that audition process come about? What was the experience yeah, like? It was, it was great. Obviously, yeah. it's a huge thing that's been received so unbelievably well, and huge congratulations on, on winning a performance at the Game Awards. No, thank you it was so much. cool thank to see you. you up there. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, yeah, Baldur's Gate 3 is a fucking dream job. Uh, a star in his dream character. He's multi-layered. He's funny. He's fun. I realized very early on into the work that I could pretty much push him in any direction and people <laughs> may not be able to stop me, which was really cool. That's fun. Um, yeah, it was really fun. I really pushed it way further than people thought it was appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> people liked it. So it was like, okay, go away with it. Um, I think I came to the audition because I was in 2019. My production company helped uh, with Square Enix on Final Fantasy 16 and also another company called Schlock run by my friend Ollie Chance. He's awesome. And um, we came on as production services. We did casting for the performance capture, combat and scene work side, which we shot in Hungary at Digic Motion, I think it's called. Hmm. Um, and at Digic, we, uh, we were doing all this. And then I th heard through the grapevine of this project, Drakenfels, that was being cast. I was like, well, Drakenfels is... Because I'm a fucking geek. Drakenfels is actually a character and mission and adventure in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So I thought, well, that sounds cool. They're you're like, you can't hide doing... from me. I know what you're doing. Yeah, right. And I was, <laughs> I was like, well, maybe that's a Warhammer Roleplay game. That's cool. I want to be on that. That's yeah. fucking, that sounds And then they sent me through the casting pack um, from Pit Stop Productions, who did all the casting and, and all the uh, all the direction stuff came through them and the voice work um, with Larian. And um, they sent me through the casting pack of images. I was like, that's not a devil kid. That's a fucking tiefling. And that's clearly a gnome. And that's clearly a da 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 It was like, holy fuck, this is Dungeons and Dragons. So my geek brain goes, okay, what is the Dungeons and Dragons things that have been successful that haven't been around for a long time? Icewind Dale and Baldur's Gate. Holy fuck, it's going to be Baldur's Gate. Mm. It's going to be Baldur's Gate. And then um, I wasn't supposed to know what, it, nobody, none of us were supposed to know what the game was. It's so funny. Then, I, 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 the amount of effort that we have to put into like our casting sides to try to keep things secret from people and I, the actors are always like, yeah, I know what it is. My, fe my feelings, if you cast somebody, if they're on board, fucking tell them what they're doing because it yeah. might help you. Can at least you know inform what I mean? them. Find yeah. an NDA. It's had, like just, you know, they're not an Video asshole, games are so scared of NDAs. <laughs> it's, it's weird. The film industry is so I different. You know? TV. Yeah, but yeah, I feel yeah. like movies well, are like, it's announced. Oh, it's canceled. Oh, it's delayed. And everyone's like, eh, video yeah. games is like such a yeah. big deal. Well, I mean, there's a lot of money involved, I guess. You know, so don't money. screw it up, people. Yeah. Um, so, I so I worked out it was probably Baldur's Gate. And then I thought, I'll, I'll play anything. I don't give a shit. So I did 10 different tapes or something like that Whoa. of all the different races that you could be. Apart, I think I drew the line at Dwarf and Hobbit. I think and Halfling, sorry. That was probably the limit. I thought I probably can't get away with that. Uh, but everything else I tried. And they, they got me in for uh, Starion. I thought he was just a big bad, just a, a random, mm. or maybe a big boss or something like that, because that's my sort of mo to be the 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 character actor on the on the shoot and play multiple roles. And then after I did the demo, uh, they told me he's actually a companion. I was like, Bleh. okay, that's actually very interesting because that means he's going to be there through most, if not all, of the game. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. And then I really liked him. I thought I had some interesting, very strong ideas with him. I was lucky that Josh Whedon, who works with Pit Stop Productions, he and I had worked on the DLC for Resident Evil 3 uh, together. So he knew me. So he knew what I, I was like as an actor. So he he was the one that I think suggested to go up for the demo. And then Jason Latino, um, Stephen Rooney was involved in the casting decision, as was Swen. Uh, and Jace, as also a guy called Farang as well. Farang was the original guy who got me in for that too. And uh, Sven was not sold. <laughs> really? I, I, yeah, Sven told me, or at least they told me later, that he wasn't sold on me. As, no way. He thought it was too much. Yeah, yeah. And it was Jason, I believe, who sort of fought my corner on that one. That's so funny. <laughs> look how that turned out. <laughs> yeah, look how it turned out. So uh. so I, mean, I, I owe Sven a lot. I owe all of Larian a lot. They're a beautiful company to work for as well. I mean, definitely what seems you like see it. is genuinely. Oh, yeah. dude, what you see is genuinely how they are. They're an amazing company to yeah. work for. I'm very blessed and feel very, very lucky. They took a chance on me and then they hired me as a mocap actor as well. And also a consultant, and then also as a director on Baldur's Gate three. So I've I've had the most incredible four and a, four and a bit years, four and a half years. It's just it's been in, an incredible company. Like it, yeah, everything they've done yeah, is amazing. so impressive. And how how amazing. many years were you having to play Astarion? Like that two thousand nineteen September two thousand nineteen. I started. It's a long time. Yeah, I wrapped. I wrapped. Um, what, where are we? We're in March. I wrapped yeah. mid. I wrapped two weeks before launch last year. Wow. Yeah. How do you um, keep track um, of where you're at? <laughs> like, how do you keep track of your character arcs in situations like that? Uh, oh, that oh, that's actually quite straightforward, really, because you have good directors you can rely on. It's their job to do you that. Have, yeah, it's their job to do that. But also, I understood the story a lot. I asked a lot of questions. Um, and also on top of that, um, I know D and D very well, and I got to. I was lucky enough that I understood a lot of how the mechanics of the world worked. So a lot of it made sense as well. Obviously, there's lots of gaps in the story. We didn't know quite a lot of the details, and so that was. And also, the writing was so good. Yeah. Stephen Rooney, creator and writer of, of Star, and he's amazing. As are all of the writers on this, and the leadership Clearly. of Adam Smith, beautiful. And Adam, Adam, um, uh, and everybody really helped us out enormously every time we were working they were on call just in case we had questions for them the directors people like Kirsty Gilmore who's incredible uh, Josh Whedon who I work with Adrian uh, Beth Park as well uh, Thomas Mitchell's Tilly Steele all these incredible actors as well as the performance directors who also came on to help um, a little bit not so much me so much but but other people really needed that which was amazing and then on top of that also intimacy directors for people who needed it as well it was an incredibly safe and beautiful experience yeah really, like one of those jobs that I think will will always that's why literally one of my my top my top ever uh, top five jobs top three jobs tops possibly the best job I've ever done. top five <laughs> top three top game for a lot of people <laughs> true there are many more that you will still appreciate um many no, more I'll still it, do but <laughs> it was the one of the top it, I mean, it clearly paid off, and I, I love the energy that comes from all of you. Like, everyone that I've met that worked in this project seems to feel that way, and it's so magical and so uncommon in video games, unfortunately, that it's you're all just, like, gushing well, about it, and I love that. Yes and no. I mean, I had, I've had, I've, I'm bit, I've always said to people, I've never had a bad day in the volume. And it's true, regardless of what I'm doing, 15 years, you doing the right thing? Yeah, and I think the main thing is I'm grateful. Um... I'm grateful for the work, grateful for the experience, grateful for the people. And by and large, there's only maybe a couple of people I wouldn't really relish working with again sure. in the whole of 15 years, which is pretty good going. Yeah. Um, and TV and film is a lot more than that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's the thing of like, there's something about the volumes. It's like a stage, it's film, it's theater, it's imagination in between. Uh, the crew and the cast are intimately close together. You can't really escape each other in a good way. Yeah. Um, there's something very beautiful about it. And, and also... You, if you want to, if you or sometimes you get scanned, sometimes you can take your face off and please yeah. anything that's appropriate to your ethnic background. I think it's or an alien. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? For me, it's like it's a really beautiful way of working as an actor. I, I love it, and yeah. uh, I've, I'm, I'm very good at it. So you know, I'm very happy. You certainly are. Again, congratulations on all the Thank awards and the love, and it's it's so well deserved. He's such a fun character. Um, before I have to let you go, I've got one more question. This is from Katie Wright yep. on Patreon. It's a very simple question, hopefully. Um, okay. Katie wanted to know how collaborative the acting work is with the writers. Like, how much input did you have on crafting a starion as a character? Do you have input on writing? How does that process work? No input on writing as such. Um, that was the amazing Stephen Rooney and the writers. Um, however, what did happen was that I took Stephen's writing initially in the first demo in the first few sessions we did, and I started doing funky things with the lines that he hadn't predicted. Which probably informed his later writing. 
which literally informed the rhythm and ideas that he liked a lot. And so he'd start writing towards the stuff mm. that I was doing with his words. Um, so I didn't change anything. He was so good, didn't need to. But I definitely did things that he didn't expect, which he then liked a lot. And then that, so we did this sort of symbiotic back and forth. Yeah. We, only, we only met after the thing launched, actually. Although we no spoke quite a few times. Yeah, we'd spoken a lot yeah. online, which was great. We had like Zoom calls and things like that. And a lot of tweets. And I even sent somebody even asked a cameo from me as a star. It was very funny. Um, <laughs> um, but we hugged. It was a, it was a gloriously yeah. well earned hug. It's such a bond, you know. I yeah, mean, I, cool. yeah. that's the power of the digital age, to be honest, is like you can have a bond with somebody like that. He has to know you intimately oh, yeah. to be able to write, you know, to how yeah, you're playing yeah. that character. And you know, that's yeah. really cool. But but in terms of development of Astarian, after the first couple of months, I pretty much set him, and then I started pushing him in lots of different ways. And again, working very closely with the directors to make sure that it wasn't like really going too wild. Yeah. Um, but wild enough, you know. Yeah. Um, and I used I used pretty much every technique and tool I've ever learned. Everything. Um, literally every tool I've ever learned, I put into the character, which was pretty fucking great. Uh, I, I even based it on I based him a little bit on the stray cat that used to live in my garden. Amazing. Uh, shit like that brilliant there's so much stuff it was great yeah again i'm sure i could talk to you about this forever <laughs> but yeah no i'm sorry i have to, <laughs> I have to let you go forever. i'm sorry yeah, um no worries. but thank you so much for joining me i also just wanted to say you are so good at crediting people like you know i've done a lot oh, of interviews in my time you're really good at, at crediting people i really just wanted to appreciate i that. wouldn't have the career i wouldn't have a career that i have i wouldn't have the opportunities i have i certainly wouldn't have won a game award without many 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 people taking a chance on me and this i could go i could carry on naming people that have literally given me a career helped me in my career give me a chance or a second chance or whatever the thing is and actually uh you know i owe other people a lot yeah um for where i am right now and i think to forget that is a very dangerous slippery slope i think because then you start losing gratitude for what you have and i think sure. that's one of the best ways to stay young uh, in life is is to be grateful and to have a great time if you can if you're lucky enough to have only maybe a few normal life challenges and nothing too bad you know if you can get through that and be appreciative of the things that you have and not feel guilty for it but just feel lucky yeah and happy it changes your life it really does what a wonderful note to end on i like <laughs> philosophical at the end here um <laughs> Neil, thank Thomas. you so much for joining me. Where can people find you if they would like to find you on the internet? Apparently the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. Um, yeah, you mentioned I that you Twitch stream. Social media. No, you're on I Twitter, on Instagram. Stream, uh, uh, Instagram, uh, that's all under Neil Newborn. YouTube is official Neil Newborn, Neil Newborn official, something like that. Um, and that's pretty much where you can find me. Cool. I'll leave links in the description below. Thank you so much for joining me. Cool. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks, Bye. See you, folks. Bye.